I'm going to stand back here because I wrote some notes, unlike what I normally do, which is just wing it. Um, I viewed a videotape this afternoon. I believe it's the one that you're discussing about for tomorrow. Is this the one by Linda Thompson? Yeah. yeah. This uh, videotape is, in my opinion, a destructive cult propaganda masterpiece. This is not credible at all. Uh, well, we can go through the entire videotape at a later point. Tonight, I'm giving my, my bashing of the U.S. government. Well, I'm just telling you my opinion because I viewed it this afternoon. And excuse me, if you, yeah, I'm stating it as an opinion. Okay, and if you're going to disrupt, I'm going to ask you to leave because there are people who've come a long distance to hear what I have to say. Um, thank you. And I'm extremely frustrated and horrified by what took place last year. Actually, the raid occurred a year from tomorrow. Um, I think that uh, that the government was certainly uh, uh, ill-advised, ill-prepared. I think the, uh, to attempt uh, a forcible assault as the, as they did with with women and children in a compound such as that was just uh, beyond stupid. Good for media, good for, you know, hype, good for, you know, Rambo style of things, but uh, in terms of serving the public good, I think it was, was horrible. And uh, unlike what destructive cults like Scientology, the Moonies, and other groups that I criticize that say that government has no right to go there at all, I do believe they had a right to go there to investigate arms, uh, to look after people's well-being, including the, the uh, alleged sexual abuse of minors uh, and such. Uh, clearly, in, in, in retrospect, what the government should have done was, was, uh, was taken David Koresh when he was jogging, when he was in town having a cheeseburger, uh, or lure him into town. And from there, they could have sent a, a handful of, of uh, agents to investigate the premises, and then it would have been a non-event. But unfortunately, they didn't do that. And uh, I also want to state that um, I have no inside track of information. I've never talked with the FBI. I've not talked with any, any insiders. Um, and so all of my information is based on, on uh, uh, interviews that I've done. Uh, with people uh, as well as media and such. So I'm sure there's lots more information that will come out later about what, what, what information was available. So I just wanted to, to, to give that uh, disclaimer too that I don't have the full facts, but I can tell you that, that it's clear by the government's activities they do not have an idea about destructive cult mentality. They were treating this as a criminal operation uh, they, were, they were treating David Koresh as a con man who was out to just, uh, was a psychopath. And uh, like most cult leaders that I've studied, he was a victim of a cult himself. And, uh, uh, and, and there's a parallel with many cult leaders, too, in that, uh, with, with sexual perpetrators, and that many of, of the sexual perpetrators were victims of child sexual abuse themselves. Uh, Vernon Howell turned into David Koresh, and uh, uh, Vernon's shadow side became dominant. Um, my orientation, my background is that I was in a cult. And uh, I was in a cult for two and a half years. I was in the Moon organization. I actually was involved in recruiting and indoctrinating people into the Moon organization. I know how cult leaders think as a generalization based on what has since become 17 years of my life work and research and helping hundreds of people involved with many different destructive uh, groups to get out. Um, I also want to comment that I made numerous efforts to try to correct the situation after the, the, uh, uh, the initial assault. I approached my congressman, Joe Kennedy's office. They n wrote numerous letters made many, many phone calls to the Department of Justice encouraging them to get in touch with me. They did not. Uh, I faxed a letter to George uh, Stephanopoulos. Uh, actually, the letter was to President Clinton. 
Um, I faxed a, a letter was faxed to attorney Massachusetts Massachusetts Attorney General uh, Harshbarger's office directly to Janet Reno. Um, and in fact, uh, I'd like to read you a portion of what I wrote uh, in that fax, which was March 30th. Uh, the compound went up in flames on April 19th. <coughs> dear, dear Attorney General Reno, I am contacting you in regards to the FBI operation in Waco, Texas. I am absolutely certain that the tactics currently being used will not result in a speedy, peaceful resolution of the standoff. This is not a typical criminal operation. This is a cult mind control situation. And I go on and, and actually uh, outline some of the things that I'll, I'll cover in a minute in terms of things that they should have done that would have resulted in a peaceful um, um, intervention. Um, also, uh, Eleanor Atchison handed a copy of my book to Webster Hubble one week, approximately one week before the final assault was given. Uh, my book, by the way, has been out since 1988. You can go to B. Dalton's. It's out. It's uh, widely regarded as the best book on the subject of cults and mind control. And, um, but, uh, and I know that Belinda Gainham, whose son David Thibodeau, was one of the few survivors who, who was able to escape the flames, um, gave copies of my book to FBI negotiators in Waco, Texas, prior to the assault as well. Um, but I've never been called. And uh, I've never been contacted, in fact, even though there was supposedly going to be a follow-up investigation into how to prevent future tragedies from occurring. And, in fact, uh, I believe there's been a big whitewash. It's been, it's been a political whitewash. Uh, and, I, and I truly believe that because of the government foul-ups from the very beginning that men, women, and children are dead, that should be alive. Um, I'd like to state that I, believe, I, that I believe that people involved with destructive cults are intelligent as a generalization, idealistic, kind, warm, loving, creative, wonderful people. And I resent a kind of blame the victim mentality that, that exists in the media, exists in society today, that, oh, those crazy people in Waco, they wanted to be controlled, they wanted to be raped, they wanted to, to have their liberties curtailed. Nonsense. Uh, these people were, in my opinion, mind controlled by David Koresh, and I want to give you my, my definition of a destructive cult, which is a pyramid-structured authoritarian group with someone or some group at the top that has total power and that uses mind control techniques to recruit and indoctrinate people to be dependent and obedient. And I define mind control in terms of four, <coughs> four components, control of behavior, control of thoughts, control of feelings, and control of information. And I'd also like to say that it doesn't matter what the belief system is, but my focus is on the methodology of practices of groups. And so a group can be a religious destructive cult, it could be a political destructive cult, it could be a therapy destructive cult, it could be a business destructive cult. If these controls of behavior, including control of sleep, food, privacy, rules and regulations, not allowing people to be alone, not allowing people to see their families, not allowing people to, to read letters, not uh, of, of critics, of seeing people outside, uh, inculcating thought-stopping techniques, telling people that if you have a negative thought about the leader or the doctrine or the group, that it's coming from your reactive mind, or it's coming from your fallen nature, or it's coming from Satan. And so you should chant or pray or meditate or speak in tongues to get rid of the negative thought. And when I was in the moon cult, that's what I was taught to do. I was told that if someone said something critical of moon or the organization, to start chanting or praying in my head to get rid of Satan, to get rid of the negativity. And so I was doing a thought-stopping technique on myself. And what happens when an intelligent person is not allowed to have doubts or is not allowed to think negative thoughts? Well, all you're left with are positive thoughts. 
your negative thoughts all get suppressed. What happens then? Reality testing is undermined. There's no, there's no way of testing out your environment. And so very bright, talented people can then become extremely dependent on someone who stands up and says, I have the answers. I know, you know what this, the, 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 seven, the seventh seal is that no one else knows. The most universal mind control technique is phobia indoctrination. Irrational fears programmed into people's minds that if they ever leave the group, terrible things are going to happen to them. Uh, some groups say you're going to get cancer, you're going to get AIDS, you're going to be hit by a car, you're going to get a heart attack, you're going to be possessed by evil spirits, you're going to be kidnapped and beaten and tortured by deprogrammers. That's a, a very common phobia of the destructive cults indoctrinating people. Um, so that as someone who has a phobia, for example, of an elevator, they can't get in an elevator, they just freeze up, their heart races and pounds and such. Someone in, under mind control cannot, and, and such a person cannot imagine riding in an elevator safely and comfortably, as most people can. Someone under mind control in a mind control cult can't imagine leaving the group and living a happy, fulfilled life. They can only generate negative imagery and only hear negative uh, words in their, in their minds. And so, yes, you know, we can look in towards the, the Qureshians and say, yeah, they could have walked out. They could have left if they wanted to, but they didn't have the capacity to in their mind. Now, mind control as practiced by destructive cults does not erase a person's real identity. But what it does is it creates a pseudo-identity that suppresses the person's real self. And so Steve Hassan, son of Milton and Estelle Hassan, was recruited into the Moonies, and now a new identity was created where now my parents were Moon and his wife. And this new identity came to believe that the old identity, Steve, was fallen, was satanic. So his poetry got thrown away. Uh, basketball was no longer considered to be an, uh, a, a, a spiritual uh, or, or a, a, a valid exercise. Seeing family and friends, going to college was no longer valid. This new cult identity was suppressing my old identity. But every single person in that cult had a real self. You know, and, and, and yet many family members and friends of those people in the compound desperately approached the FBI and said, please deliver a letter. Please let me talk with them. I'll go on to the compound. Let me, and the FBI put up a wall, an information wall, to deprive access of these people to those connections to reality emotional connections, behavioral connections, life connections. And, and that was a horrible, horrible error in judgment. Um, uh, uh, David Korsh's own grandmother wanted to speak with him. They wouldn't allow it. Steve Snyder, the lieutenant, the number two person, was very close with his sister, Sue Johnson, who I've spoken with on the phone. She wanted desperately to speak with her brother. FBI prohibited it. So this dual identity concept is very important. I've read in, the, in, in reports where the negotiators would, would say that David Koresh would one moment be very rational, very, very warm and, and easygoing and communicative, and then all of a sudden he'd snap and he'd become this raving lunatic. And they described it as mood swings. Well, from my perspective, it wasn't a mood swing. It was an identity shift that was going. It was used flipping backward from Vernon to David, back and forth. But the FBI didn't understand this concept, didn't understand how to elicit Vernon Howell, because it was Vernon Howell who would have come out peaceably, in my opinion, uh, not David Koresh. Um, so other things that I thought that the government did wrong and things they should have done. I think that, that they, 
needed to bring in a third-party negotiator. And I've read a lot of newspaper reports and magazine reports, and I've, I've not seen it written anywhere except by researcher, Harvard researcher, uh, Alan Stone, who was one of the very few people uh, asked uh, by the government as a follow-up investigator who actually criticized the government. And I just read his report, and he actually said, we need, that situation called for a third-party negotiator. And I completely agree with that. Why? Because inside the compound, their view was the FBI was evil. They came, they shot their dogs. They shot their people. Their, pe their friends were, do you know, uh, dead, bleeding and such. The FBI would come around with tanks and crush their, their bicycles, crush their cars, crush his boat. I intimidating, violent. So in order to facilitate a peaceful negotiation to bring in someone that, 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 that David Koresh could view as at least neutral or at least you know, wasn't you know, part of the, the, uh, the forces to do harm to them, that would have made a very big difference. They gave one radio. What was the psychology of giving one radio? See, for me, information control is a mind control technique. And when you're trying to help someone who's under mind control, you want to give them information. And so, in my opinion, they should have given 100 radios. Why? Because every single person there was a human being, and every person had, had uh, uh, the capacity to say, I want to listen too. So why not let them sit in, in boxes in front of everyone if David Koresh wouldn't let anyone else listen and let them be thinking, oh, the government wanted us to have these radios, but David's not letting us have these radios, as opposed to, well, we don't know what's going on. Only David and only Steve Snyder know what's, knows what's going on, and they know what's best. Um, I thought it was an error to, to torture them, to cut off their electricity, to not allow medical aid. When you're in a mindset that is black and white, that the outside world is evil, and you know you're dealing with someone who has this mindset, the, the greatest thing you can do is undermine that worldview. And so what was called for was paradoxical interventions. And I was quoted in the Globe uh, on page one right after the, right after the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fire, and I said, the FBI mentality is wrong, 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 wrong. They would have done better to, to, uh, to call a truce and set up picnic baskets and give them fried chicken. And I meant it. Why? Because the members would then be seeing, hey, they're being nice to us. You know? I would have, I would have arranged truces so people could come out in the sun. So they, could, they wouldn't be treated like rats, like objects, like criminals. The FBI brought in their hostage negotiation team. This was not a hostage situation. This was a cult mind control situation. Um, I, would have, I would have brought <laughs> exit counseling information to people in cults. When I was in the Moonies, I was programmed not to have negative thoughts about the Moonies, as I just indicated. So. Likewise, when my father and my mother, who loved me very much, still do, fortunately they're still alive, and they'd say, but Steve, Moon has an M16 gun factory, or, you know, Steve, he's this, you know, multi-millionaire. How could you believe in him? I'd go, you know, crush Satan, crush Satan, crush Satan. My parents didn't understand that a frontal approach wasn't going to work. But what w the weakness is that when you're involved with a destructive cult is you're not taught to, to stop negative thoughts about other groups. And so if you're talking to someone in the Moonies, you can talk to them about a different group and how it uses mind control. And they'll think about it. And so you can dis there were there were survivors of Jonestown that wanted to go down there and talk with these folks. And they could have talked about Jim Jones and they could have talked about what was going on in Guyana and what was happening in the phobia indoctrination. They could have talked with them about love and the central message of the Bible, which is love and service and kindness. They could have talked about control of thoughts and feelings. They could have, they could have given that information. Time was on the outside world side to help the people inside 
But unfortunately, the FBI did things like sleep deprivation. Bright lights, loud blaring music of rabbits being slaughtered and Tibetan chants and Nancy Sinatra singing these boots are made for walking. And I'm not sure which of those three is the worst. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, what they were doing was classic brainwashing techniques. The FBI was doing brainwashing, co physical coercive, sleep deprivation, undermining people's uh, faculties, a and yet in an information vacuum, all that was doing was making the people more dependent on David Koresh and making him more whacked out. So I, I feel that the FBI um, provoked further, further uh, disintegration of the situation there through their methodology. Um, and <laughs> I mean, th there are people who are not cult experts who, who are looking at that and going, that's stupid. But what was going on in, 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 in government officials' minds, thinking that this was a good thing to do? And by the way, what about the children? Wasn't this about helping kids? Well, the kids were there. They were getting tortured. They were being kept frozen. They were not get, being given, they were given some milk. They weren't being given nourishing food and such. Um, what else? So there could have been interventions done with Steve Snyder, I believe. There could have been interventions done directly with David Koresh. David Koresh had a thing about women. I mean, I, I guess most of you have read the reports about how he abolished all relationships, all sexual relationships between husbands and wives, and he, he could have sex with all the women in the group and nobody else could and such. I, I would have recommended women negotiators. I think one of the things the government did right was they allowed Dick DeGuerin, a lawyer hired by uh, Koresh's grandmother, to go in and see him. And I think DeGuerin could have gotten them to come out. I would have gone one step further. I would have sent in lawyers for every single member there. Again, we want to break down the isolation. We want to give people a sense of hope. We want to undermine the phobia indoctrination. So we want people to be thinking they have a future. We want people to be connecting up to their past and to their loved ones and to, 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 to creative um, uh, uh, instincts within themselves. Um, I, I would, you know, I, I wonder what David Korsh would, would say if someone, um, you know, uh, on the team said, you know, I had a dream last night that, 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 that God had a very important message for you, David. How would David Korsh have, re could, ha could have, what, how could he have not been responsive? to somebody saying, I had a dream about you, or I had a dream that God wanted to, to make something happen with you, and such. Because it's entering his model of reality. And in fact, I think it was a good thing that they, they brought in some, some uh, of the, uh, the biblical scholars, not the early ones, but later on, where they were saying, well, you know, the interpretation of Revelation says that there probably is more time that you have. So why don't you write out your interpretation of the of the seals and, and encouraging him to think about a future. You know, you can do, get, do a movie on your life and this and that. That would have um, opened up doors towards, towards, um, towards a future. The, um, the whole use of, of CS gas was totally horrible, stupid. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a weapon of war. That, that with adults, they can have pulmonary failure with. Again, wh where were the children? We're in, in the thinking of the officials, and they were thinking about, about gassing. What about the tanks? What about the language? Think about the language. The final words that were, were, that were told to the members before the tanks started destroying the walls, and, and, and canisters were being ejected at high speed. And, and exploding inside. They're saying, this is not an assault. Excuse me? My walls are falling down. Things are exploding. It's not an assault? 
And just the language, if one wants to talk about language for a second, saying this is not an assault is like saying, um, don't think of a white horse. You know, this is not an assault. We are not attacking you now. So, of course, how are they going to respond? Well, how, and how rational are you going to be when you are choking, when you're when, when, when your, your lungs are burning, when, you're, when, you're, when you're, um, you have chest pain, nausea, gagging, inflamed eyes, nose, throat, um, insane. Um, why weren't both experts contacted in you? I understand from reading Dr. Stone's report that there were behavioral scientists who had said that this is an, a, a situation where using a heavy hand and doing a, a forcible type of approach was not going to work. Why weren't those people listened to? Um, uh, there's still so many, many uh, uh, answers that I want. And I don't think that, that uh, we're getting real answers. Um, Unlike the video that I watched this afternoon that says that the whole thing was, was the Cult Awareness Network, which is, likes to kidnap and beat and torture people, which is, in my opinion, total nonsense, uh, cult propaganda to try to put down cult watchers uh, like myself. By the way, I do not kidnap people. I do not deprogram people. I do not beat and torture and rape people, despite what destructive cults like to say about me. Um, and I don't think that the individuals in the government were really out to harm men, women, and children. But I think it's reasonable to guess, and I'm completely speculating now, and it's my personal opinion, uh, based on what I've heard, that the ATF was coming up for budget reconsideration. They wanted to get more money. They wanted a big, splashy, you know, sexy, media-savvy thing, so they they did this, you know, frontal assault on these poor people. And once that happened and, and people died, and by the way, uh, it was not a surprise assault, and, and, and the documents have come out to prove that. So the, the whole, and, and experts have said, you know, with, a, with, a, with an armed assault like that, in a criminal operation, if you lose the element of surprise, you should call it off. But they didn't call it off, and so people died. And I think that, that government agents were angry that some of their own died. And uh, I think they, they wanted retribution. And, and the poor victims, uh, in my opinion, of David Koresh have paid the price and are still paying the price. It's my personal opinion that, that these individuals should not go to jail. And if anything, I'd like to have see them counseled, and I like to see them reunited with their families, and I like to see them given another chance um, after the horrible, horrible trauma that they have lived through. Um, lots more to say. Let's see. <coughs> I think I, I this, this is a miraculous thing for me, because I think I've covered some of the basics that I wanted to say. I usually suffer from needing to say too much in too short a time. Since I have a little short, would you, uh, since you spoke, would you tell us a little bit about what you will feel about the response of President Clinton and Janet Reno? Yes, yes. Well, Janet Reno, as far as I can tell, um, was not given good information, and she was relatively new in her post, and I think she was out of, out of her league. And, uh, I mean, she should have exercised common sense which he didn't. And I think for that, she probably should have resigned. Uh, yeah, just hang on a second. Um, I mean, how, how can somebody who says, I, I, I was doing it to help the children, how could someone like that authorize the use of CS gas in a closed environment on children? Uh, the, so the, the, that falls, you know, breaks that to pieces. I think blaming it all at David Koresh, you know, which President Clinton did, is equivalent to um, um, going into a basement where you know there's a gas leak that's been going on for an hour and, 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 and striking a match and then, and then blaming 
uh, uh, the gas company for a gas leak. I mean, he, there, there were numerous former members who were saying for years he's a demagogue, he is power hungry, he's control crazy. They knew that they had hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, of, of weapons there. They, they had all of that information and to go in the way that they did was, was irresponsible. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, I, as I wrote <laughs> in my letter to Clinton, I said, I'm writing to ask you to personally intervene in the FBI. This was March 19th. This was a month before it went up in flames. To personally intervene in the FBI handling of the Branch Davidian cult situation in Waco, Texas. I am appealing to you directly because I believe you could help to prevent further embarrassment, psychological torture of innocent cult victims, as well as loss of life. Please help the more than 100 people who are under the mind control of David Koresh. The way the government has conducted itself so far has been a national embarrassment and the ATF and the FBI's refusal to admit that they do not know how to deal with a cult leader forces the situation to continue on unnecessarily. The nature of the initial confrontation is not being aided by cutting off electricity and shining bright lights at night in the compound. These tactics make your administration look anti-religious, which I know it is not. It also makes your administration look bad to use such coercive measures where children are concerned. So, uh, and I, I think it's still whitewashed. As I said, I'm, I, I don't know if anyone is here from the FBI, but I'm, I'm still waiting for somebody to say, gee, Steve, you have 20 years of background in the work with people involved with destructive cults. How about sharing some ideas? And I have many more ideas than what I've shared, but these are some of the basic ones. Things like bringing in a third-party negotiator, utilizing the family, giving information, putting information into into the compound about other destructive cults and what mind control is and what phobia indoctrination is. Those are just a few, you know, common sense, basic uh, things. Being nice to them, calling, the, allowing lawyers to go in and meet with them, allowing cards and letters to go in and such, in and out. Utilizing Sue Johnson to try to influence Steve Snyder because he, he could have uh, helped to undo the entire situation as well. Um, I also would like to, to make a comment that I'm aware that the FBI could have assassinated uh, David Koresh on numerous occasions. They had him in the crosshairs of, of, of sniper rifles numerous times. And so I'm glad that they didn't do that. But in the context of everyone being dead, um, um, it, 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 I, I don't even know what to say about that, except that I, I don't like the use of guns personally, anyway. Um, but, uh, mm. okay, so question. Yeah. Uh, before you do, please be thinking about the question. Before you do, can I just ask, how many of you uh, are here tonight because you saw the notice in uh, the Thursday Boston Globe calendar? Right? You raise your hand and you just want to get an idea of, you know, how it works How many of you are here this is a marketing survey. How many cars have been posted around town? Oh, for Yeah, and I've How many that? How many in the How many that? So let me, I would just want to make one other um, statement before we go on with questions and answers. So just to restate, I believe that people have the right to believe whatever they want. If they want to believe Moon is the Messiah and bow to an altar with his picture on it, fine. But where I criticize organizations is in their use of methodology where they are recruiting people and indoctrinating people before there's informed choice. You need information in order to make a good choice. And when I was recruited by the Moonies, I asked the recruiters, are you part of some religious group? They looked me in the eye and said, no, not at all. And they infringed on my civil rights. 
and it was only the first of many different lies. I had no interest in dropping out of school, quitting my job, and cutting off from my family and friends. But due to the controls in the workshop environment, the isolation, the sleep deprivation, the manipulation of information, the use of hypnotic techniques, which I really haven't mentioned yet. But David Koresh was using hypnotic patterning. And when you're sitting there for 18 hours, and he's going on and on and on with his indoctrination, it goes beyond and past your intellectual critical faculties. And uh, I know there was a Harvard-trained lawyer who was a follower of his group. I want to restate, people involved with destructive cults are not uh, to blame. They're not crazy. They're not weak. They're not stupid. They may have been at a vulnerable point in their life when they were approached, and they may have not uh, asked critical questions like, well, what do you expect of me after I join, or what is the real beliefs of this group, or what is the background of the leader, or what, uh, what will happen to me if I want to leave later, um, or uh, what is the nature of the controversy of this group. Um, and so, uh, and I believe legitimate organizations will tell people up front who they are, what they believe, and what they expect of them. And if people don't want to belong any longer, they go, good luck. They don't say, if you leave, Satan will possess you. You know, or, if you leave, you will lose, you know, your entire existence. Or if you leave, you will get cancer. Um, or if you leave, you will go insane. But destructive mind control uh, cults do do that. Um, so this, for me, is a human rights issue. It's a consumer rights issue. And I believe that, again, that uh, I'm not interested in criticizing a group's beliefs, but I criticize actions when it undermines people's civil, liberta civil liberties. Yes? You mean my coming out of the Moonies or my going into Waco? Right. Essentially, I believe in taking a loving, respectful, inquisitive. Well, my, my process, well, uh, this is an opportunity to plug my book because it will give you more detail than I can give you right now. But essentially, in my case, I fell asleep at the wheel of a van driving 80 miles an hour due to sleep deprivation. And after two weeks in the hospital, I was able to get permission to visit my sister, at which point my parents hired ex-members to deprogram me. And five days after uh, of the deprogramming, I started questioning whether or not Moon was the Messiah. On the fourth day, I said, I don't care if Moon is like Hitler. I've chosen to follow him, and I'll follow him to the end. Coming from a Jewish background, that was very weird. <laughs> but that was how I was indoctrinated. That's how far gone I was. And in coming out of that experience and, 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 and realizing the horror of how far I had been taken away from myself and my own values and my own integrity, it caused me to research this whole subject and to spend 17 years of my life helping people to come away from totalitarian organizations. Um, on a larger political note, I'd like to mention that two years ago I was in Moscow giving a seminar about mind control and talking about behavior control and thought control and emotional control and information control. And one of the psychologists said, Mr. Hassan, are you aware that you're describing the entire pedagogical system of the Soviet Union? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and, he said, and he said to me, uh, you know, are, are you aware you're describing young pioneers and Komsomo? And I said, yes, I am. I said, the model that was used to help me to understand my moon experience was the Chinese communist system and a, a very important and relevant book to this day called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Robert J. Lifton. Now, one other comment before we go on to questions. 
the scariest thing, the scariest single thing of e everything in the last 20 years is that the U.S. government, particularly the CIA, which has done more mind control research than any other ins ins institution in the history of mankind, with the, the perhaps exception of the KGB, has never said, made a statement stating that mind control techniques exist. In fact, in 1979, ABC did a special based on a book called The Search for the Manchurian Candidate that documented CIA, LSD, hypnosis, and electroshock therapy uh, research of the 50s and early 60s. And John Ginniger, former chief psychologist of the CIA, said that, they, yes, they did do some mind control research, but they didn't find anything that worked, and they stopped all research in 1973, and they burned their records. So, well, and yeah, and, 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 and yeah, so, I mean, the, 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 the connection of the, of the knowledge that we have amassed about how the mind works, about how communication works, about how we process information, about how we act in groups, is, can be used to sell products, as we know so well, can be used to help give people choices, as in good and ethical therapy, or it can be used to take away people's choices and to narrow and constrict people. And I think that it's essential for us in a, in a free society, quote unquote, to understand these mechanisms of mind control and, and to not get obscured by content beliefs of particular groups, but, but look at how groups are operating, including our government, including our military and such. And Ultimately, I think our, own, our future lies in each person taking responsibility through choice, through information, and not just denying. I think there's a, a tremendous fear that people have in thinking about mind control, because they, they, it could never happen to me. You know, it's those weak people over there. It could never happen to me. Well, if you have that belief and you don't understand mind control, it can happen to you. In fact, it's very easy to manipulate someone who's convinced that they can't be manipulated. You tell, I can't go into a trance. You say, okay, don't go into a trance. I order you not to go into a trance. Then what are they going to do? Yes. Is this a question or is this a, a statement? Uh, the third one's a question. The first one is just to say that I really, um, I've done a lot of research into this issue, and I, I really su support a lot of your uh, yeah, recommendations on prognosis for government blunders in this, in this case. I really agree they're unconscionable and foreign. Um, secondly, I just wanted to recommend in addition to Dr. Stone's report, there are two other reports. Um, Nancy Hammermans was at Princeton and said she ever liked the study in the New Religious Movement. And uh, Lauren Sullivan is here at the Center for the Study of World Religions, and they're both probably equally as critical of the government's hammer. So I am, would love to speak with those two other sources. Uh, reports are reviewed when they talk about FBI needing some more input. There was a little bit more. But thirdly, I guess this is um, the point where I would differ from your analysis is I'd just like to see how you would draw the, the line. Something, a group like the Branch Davidians pre, pre the siege, pre February 28th, in which uh, family members were allowed in general to write letters and contact group, group members. Group members were allowed to leave and, and did on occasion. Several group members worked outside of the compound. One was a postman, one was, uh, as you said, a lawyer, and were generally moving back and forth in the real world. Um, as do most people in destructive cults, in my opinion. Right, and, and if you describe yourself intelligent, uh, creative, wonderful, normal people just like you and I. A group, <laughs> has to, a group like this with, uh, I guess I don't, I don't want to be overly confrontational, but let's say the traditional deprogrammer in which uh, in the process of a series of deprogramming, usually the target is not allowed to sleep with their coworkers and staying with this person for the brainwashing techniques that you yourself are describing. Mm -hmm. Or uh, contrast this with the organized church in which you are told from a very early age that if you don't believe these things, you will go to hell. Mm -hmm. You're not really given much choice about it, and uh, no one seems to have much trouble with 
very nice church doing this. And as you said, I have a problem with any institution doing behavior control, thought control, emotional control, and information control for the purpose of keeping people dependent and obedient to some other external authority figure. I have a problem with any organization that does that. I think I think that good parenting recognizes that from birth through the growth cycle there are many different forms of parenting and that when an infant uh, when 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 a child is an infant it requires the parent to make decisions to give food and and to give shelter and to protect but the intention ideally is to encourage the child to grow up to maturity and to autonomous individuality and not to keep the person controlled by fear, controlled by guilt, dependent, um, narrow with phobias. Are there dysfunctional families? Yes. Are there painful, you know, parental relationships? Yes. Does that make it okay for a group like the Moon Organization or Scientology to do what it does? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think it, two, right make, uh, two wrongs make a right, and I don't buy into this kind of analogy of, well, you know, my Catholic Church teacher used to do this, therefore what David Koresh was doing to an 11-year-old is okay. Um, I don't think it's a... I don't think it's hard at all because I make very clear behavioral distinctions and I invite you to read my book and to have further dialogue on it because there really are fundamental distinctions and I think that legitimate groups especially religious organizations don't ask for commitment before there's conveyance of information about what the group believes and what the group practices and what's expected of the person so that there can be informed choice. And I think, for example, with Scientology, this is an organization that says, we are a religion, we are a religion. But you can't know what the upper level beliefs are, the OT beliefs are, until you've gone up through all of the courses. Because if you find out that information before you're ready, you will die. That's what they teach. So you're getting involved with an organization that, uh, whose upper level of the pyramid, you don't even know what the beliefs are. And by the way, one of the big ones is that 73 million years ago, there was a galactic confederation of planets with Xenu, a despotic dictator who was trying to solve the overpopulation problem. So he was bringing all the beings to the planet Earth, then called Tigiak, and dropping them in volcanoes and dropping hydrogen bombs on them, which is why in Dianetics is a volcano on the cover. What sane, what sane person, intelligent person, would join a religion with that belief? But you see, nobody knows that until years later and tens of thousands of dollars later. But that is, I mean, I'm telling you the story as related by the documents from former top officials who've left. And I think that makes a very different, it's a very different animal than, than the Catholic Church or, or, uh, or other so-called mainstream religions. But I abhor any uh, totalitarian system that undermines people's free rights. You, you, you've had your question. Next question. Yes. Given the destructive nature of these cults, given the fact that we do have a commitment to religious freedom, and it's yeah. Freedom, what actions do you think would be appropriate on the part of the government with respect to a destructive cult group that hasn't committed any crimes? Should the government just ignore it, or are there things that you legitimately do? Oh, if, uh, the way the, the, the government exists around laws, and if a group isn't breaking laws, then the government shouldn't be involved. Do I think the law needs to be updated to include the fact that there is hypnosis, for example, that people can be manipulated without the use of a gun or without the use of external force to do things that are destructive? Yes, I think the, the law should be updated to include that. but. Not until there's, there are um, universal methods for evaluating that that can be applicable in order to preserve freedom. And, and by the way, I think the baseline document to read is the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
And if destructive cults supported the human rights in that documents, then I wouldn't be up, there, up here criticizing, because they don't. Anything else? Yes. I, I want to ask you, what about TM? I don't know too much about it. But I know Transcendental meditation is a group that I do consider to be a destructive cult. Why? Am I against meditation? No, I'm not against meditation. I meditate myself personally. But here's, here's a classic example of a group that says, we're not a religion, we're not a philosophy, we're not a lifestyle, but they believe that Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is the greatest spiritual leader on the planet Earth. They're all vegetarian. And the puja ceremony in which you're given your mantra is actually, according to Maharishi, saying it is an, indoctr uh, is an initiation to Hinduism. This is, this is an organization that says that if you have uh, any anxiety or any stress, meditate. Well, as a therapist, I know that stress and anxiety is a very Im important thing to have because they tell us to pay attention to things. And that if, if we are having anxiety, it could be because we should get out of the way of that moving car, you know, or that, you know, we need to get counseling for our marriage, or uh, that uh, we have to go see our doctor because that pain that we're experiencing isn't normal. Um, but you're, if you're doing it as a thought-stopping methodology or as a way to just get into trance, I think it can be very destructive. Also, there are many different ways to meditate. And one way is not going to be good for everyone. And yet TMers, uh, the true, you know, the, the fanatical ones, believe everyone should do it their way. And stu some studies have been done to, that suggest up to 40% of the general public actually have more stress from repeating a mantra over and over and over again, <coughs> as, a, as opposed to other types of meditation. So let me just back backtrack and say, what's my concern about TM? That they are deceptive. And that past the 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon, which I have no problem with at all, if you take the advanced courses and get further and further and further involved and you up, up the pyramid, it becomes more and more totalitarian and destructive. And there are many former top leaders of TM that can tell you what's really going on inside that group. Yes? Uh, I have a question about your own personal experience. When you entered uh, the movement, what was that a gradual experience or was it a stepwise sudden snapping? It was... Uh, <coughs> every, the, my experience is that the vast number of people who get into a destructive cult get recruited at a vulnerable point in their life. What does that mean? When they break up in a relationship, when they experience the death of a loved one, when they become unemployed, when they move to a strange lo uh, a new location, uh, with, when they're off balance. For me, I had broken up with a girlfriend I was approached by three women in the cafeteria who were smiling and flirting with me. And that, so my vulnerability was twofold, breaking up with my girlfriend and ignorance about deceptive mind control cults. Um, for me, what they did was say, why don't you come for dinner? We'd like to cook you dinner. Come on over. So that was step one. Step two was, I want you to meet some of our friends from all over the world. We're kind of like a little United Nations here, which seemed really nice to me, and I was interested to meet people from different cultures and such. The next thing was, we're going away for the weekend. Come on along. They didn't say we're going to have a three-day workshop where you're going to have eight hours a day of, of lectures. You'll never be allowed to go, uh, never be alone for a minute, not even to go to the bathroom. You know, we believe that Sun Myung Moon is the Messiah and that he has to choose who you're going to marry and when you can have sex and what position you can have sex and such. They didn't say any of that. So to get to the heart of your question, for me, it was a snapping experience at the workshop site, and they wanted me to stay. My inside was saying, get out of here, get out of here. <laughs> and I left at like 2 in the morning. I left, but I went home, but I, it was already in my head. And I talked to my mom, and she said, oh, let's go talk to the rabbi. We went and talked to the rabbi. Then that convinced me that I wanted to learn more about the group. It was very, <laughs> talk about polarity responses. And um, um, within one more week, I was having, I had long hair. My hair was getting cut. My blue jeans were throwing out. I was putting on a suit and 
my journey went. And it was three months into the experience that I, that I, that I remember stopping any thoughts of doubt. And I was made a leader, and I recruited and indoctrinated hundreds of people into the organization. By the way, I was at a leadership uh, situation with Moon where he said in the fall of 1974, he said, quote, when we take power in America, we will amend the Constitution and make it a capital offense for people to have sexual relations with people other than those assigned to them by the church, unquote. And then he proceeded to say, if people can't control their their, their sexuality, we will be doing them a favor by taking their physical bodies away from them and sending them to the spirit world where they can be restored later. And my response was, yes, Father. Yes. Well, who hasn't asked the question? Okay. Uh, can a general statement be made about the, uh, the heads of cults? Are any of them actually just criminals or... <laughs> there are a number of con men who are heads of cults, but the vast number in my experience are people who really believe their stuff, and as I mentioned before, that they themselves were victims of a cult. L. Ron Hubbard, the head of Scientology, was a follower of Aleister Crowley, by the way. Werner Earhart, head of Est and Forum, he was a Scientologist. Uh, Moon was involved with a cult in, in Korea called the Monastery of Israel. Um, so, and, and most con men, they want to make money and they want to they split. They don't want to get caught. They don't want to have problems. They don't stay around. But cult leaders make, make decisions based on that they really think that what they're doing is good and justified and that they're above the law and such. And, uh, and so... Uh, yes? Well, he was involved with, with George Rodin, who, uh, and he, George Rodin, was the head of the group before, and Vernon Howell joined this particular group, later had a, started having sex with Rodin's uh, wife. Rodin wound up going to, uh, to be put in a mental hospital. There was a whole shootout situation, and a challenge to raise the dead and all of that. But um, I, it's, it's my personal belief that David, David Koresh, a.k.a. Uh, Vernon Howell, could have been convinced to leave peaceably from the standoff and that, you know, he was not a psychopath. He was acting psychopathically, but he was not a psychopath. And, uh, and I believe that going, going in with tanks and with CS gas was, I, 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 I knew that morning, I had CNN on, I saw the, the tanks moving and I had heard rumors a week earlier they were going to bring in tanks and gas from contacts down in Waco. And as soon as I saw the tanks, I got, my God, they're all dead. And they died. And I cried. As I cried when I saw the carnage at Jonestown. Because I saw, you know, but by the grace of God, I believe in God, uh, I, that could have been me. I could have died. I could have, I could have been in the flames. I could have had the gun out. Uh, and I feel so sorry for the, the people who, uh, who, who, who uh, have survived the loss of, of all their friends. I feel so, so sorry for the families. And I feel sorry for, for all people involved with destructive mind control uh, cult experiences. And I think that, that people deserve to be free. Yes. Back there. I just wanted to ask a question. You had mentioned earlier about the Cult Conscious Network. Yes. And how we're not involved in deprogramming kidnapping, and also how more um, experts on cults should have advised the FBI. And I'm just wondering about the, the contact that Rick Ross, who was an expert for the Cult Conscious Network, had with the FBI, who was actually encouraging the actors of the movement. Yeah. The Cult Awareness Network, the entity, the Cult Awareness Network, which is a nonprofit educational organization, does not support, endorse any kidnapping or deprogramming activities, but they are concerned about destructive cults and they are a source for information and referral 
There are individuals who subscribe to their newsletters and go to their conferences who engage in forcible attempts at interventions to help people involved with, with destructive cults, like Rick Ross. Uh, I have no love for Rick Ross. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned him because at the point that the FBI was shining the bright lights and doing the, the, the auditory um, barrage, I criticized it. I was quoted in, in uh, numerous newspapers and AP and such. And Rick Ross called me and said, Steve, you don't understand what's going on. The FBI knows what they're doing. Don't say these things. Uh, critical of the FBI. I said, Rick, the FBI doesn't know what the hell they're doing. They're torturing people. They're making, they're reinforcing Koresh's worldview, and they're making people even more vulnerable. And yes, he was consulted by the FBI. He's, he's the only person that I am aware of that even has any uh, uh, connection with the Cult Awareness Network in the sense of that he even has attended some of their meetings. And I think personally that, uh, that the FBI made a major error to rely on in, in even talking with him because he was never in a cult himself. He doesn't know how to think like a cult member. And, and, and in my experience, my ability, because of my first-hand experience, to be able to go inside the mindset is what helps me to be, have empathy and also to have an awareness of what, what to say and how to say it. Um, uh, groups like uh, destructive cults, some of which I mentioned before, have uh, created an image that there's this multi-million dollar international neo-Nazi group of kidnappers who like to beat and torture people out of new religious groups, and they're the Cult Awareness Network. And the reason why Waco went up in flames is because the Cult Awareness Network was really behind the FBI, and it's all these evil people. And I say, that's just cult propaganda. That's bull. <laughs> that is not correct. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's my personal opinion, and it's based on 20 years of my experience. Did, did you want to say something? Because your hand was up 40 times. Uh, do you think, I mean, just, just to go to the end outcome, do you think the government is justified in conducting the raid in the of any way? Oh, an armed raid with 80 agents, the way they did it? No. Okay. But do I think they were justified in going there to, to look for firearms and to, and to investigate uh, uh, claims of sexual abuse of minors? Absolutely. Now, the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms is exactly one mission, as defined by the United States government, that is collecting taxes on alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Why were they involved in supposedly protecting children? I don't have an answer for that, and I'm, I'm, not, an, I'm, not, a, I'm not a defender of, of the U.S. government, if you've heard anything that I've said in previous minutes. David Grace and the Branch Division has investigated twice the Texas State Authorities, and no trial of abuse was found. you know that? Well, I'm aware that um, it's difficult to use ordinary um, self-report types of things with destructive cults. You can't go into a destructive cult as an agent of the enemy government and say, by the way, is anyone harming you? And they'll say, no, not at all. I'm fine. One of the most powerful things, and the, anyone who's really interested in getting to the, to the, to the underpinning of, of, of mind control with David Koresh, is looking at the artwork of the children who were released during the siege done and evaluated by a, uh, a, a trauma specialist named Dr. Perry. If anyone doubts that mind control exists, look at the artwork that was done by these kids, and it is so clear. The split of identity, the incredible fear and indoctrination in terms of, of going up in flames and the outside world and such, and a completely diminished as opposed to a healthy sense of self-identity and, 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 and normal relations, as would, as would be de depicted in, uh, in the artwork of, of a healthy child. Um, who hasn't asked a question yet? Yes? Does that enable some that the people who were released, the children who were released in the first and second of March, what, do you have any ideas about how come they were allowed to leave or those to leave? Um, 
They were not any of, of Koresh's own children, I know that much. And I believe some of the adults were the ones that were, that were bringing the kids out, the ones who had walked out. And those were people who clearly had problems with what was going on there. In other words, they weren't totally un under the spell any longer of David Koresh, and they wanted out. And David didn't want people who were asking questions there. In fact, I could understand how the FBI was thinking, well, yeah, the, the more people we get out of the situation, the more people we, we can save. And that is right thinking on one level. But uh, from a perspective of trying to undermine the totalitarian control that David Koresh had, it was actually better to keep people who were doubting with those other people inside instead of weeding them out. I'm not saying that I would have done that, but... Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, this is back to the Cult Awareness Network. Uh, Galen Kelly, who is uh, a member of the Cult Awareness Network, was recently convicted of kidnapping. Correct. The FBI Being a member of the Cult Awareness Network means that you <coughs> pay $30 and you subscribe to their newsletter, uh, which I believe he did. Right. But cult groups like to say, oh, he was an agent of the Cult Awareness Network. The Cult Awareness Network kidnaps people and beats and tortures them. I don't, it's just not true in my experience. But you can say it over and over again, and you can say it, and you can say it, and you can say it, but... I wasn't pointing at you. Yes. That's not my understanding that anyone is frowning about the Cult Awareness Network. They, they have top lawyers, top mental health professionals involved with the organization, and I think they do a good job. I have not given a speech for the organization in years. I am not a member of the Cult Awareness Network. If you buy my book and read it, I do recommend them as a source of information about cults and mind control. And I'm also aware of a new project that's being started called FACT, which is a computer database for uh, uh, collecting information about destructive cults that anyone can dial in with a modem and download files about destructive cults. And I think that's the future. Uh, and, and that way, people can find out information um, uh, much more easily and quickly and without the human component inside there. I don't think they are. You're making a, a statement, and I said that I don't think they are. Well, I, mean, I certainly wouldn't want somebody involved with kidnapping. I mean, if you can get to that. Cult Awareness Network is not involved with kidnapping. That's not right. Patricia Ryan, who is president of the Cult Awareness Network, whose father, Leo Ryan, Congressman Leo Ryan, was killed at Jonestown, does not endorse kidnapping, has never endorsed kidnapping. The organization does not kidnap does not recommend kidnapping. Can I say it over and over and over again? But the people involved with destructive cults, they've been told this is what it is, so that is what they think. But it's not, in my experience, true. Well, even though they say, I kidnap people and beat and torture. Uh, who hasn't said something? Yes. You said that it took you 17 years to come to the point of writing your book. No, it wasn't quite that long. I, my book came out in 1988, so it came out 11 years after I got out. Okay. But for, for you to, because now you, you know the, the mindset of the cult, so you can go back and forth, and you're able to do so. How long did it take you to be able to do that? I'm not sure if I understand your question. For me, w the fifth day of my intervention, and I should say I called it a deprogramming. It started involuntary for the first day, but then it was voluntary, as you will read in my book if you ever get it. Um, um, I agreed to speak with the ex-members to prove to my parents that I wasn't under mind control. And fortunately for me, on the fifth day, I did start to think that maybe Moon wasn't perfect at which point I started researching the whole psychology of brainwashing, mind control, influence processes, persuasion, attitude change, etc. And so the mo at the moment that I got, I realized Moon wasn't the Messiah, I was never going to go back. And it took me a while to remember feelings, remember memories even, because when I was in the group, they had recoded my entire childhood to be a, a horribly oppressive experience as compared to what it really was, which was I had, came from a very loving 
close family, good friends. I was an extra honor student. Uh, as I mentioned before, I wrote poetry. I was a creative writing major. But it took me time to heal. It took me at least a year to heal. And one of the things that helped me the most to heal was interacting with former cult members of the group I was in and former members of other groups. And so, at, so for me, it's been a continuous l learning experience in terms of interacting with people from other destructive cults. But um, the people who know the most are the ex-members. And, and there are many of them. If you want to talk with them, they can share their own experiences. Would you like to say something? Will it be very brief? Because we're about to end. Just go on. Yeah, Martin, Mr. Martin, Wayne Martin. I see an analogy which hasn't been mentioned, I don't think, in the media to the MOVE situation in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. There was a destructive cult in Philadelphia in which the government went in and dropped a bomb and, and, and killed people and burned down a lot of homes as well. Total inappropriate use of force and total lack of regard for human rights and, and respect for, 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 for life. The, 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 the term cult, while I think it's an accurate term for courageous uh, group of sort of small c, whatever, the problem I have with it, the way it's used in the media, is cult, uh, cult members acquitted, cultists acquitted, and it's it's a de it becomes dehuman. It's a way of dehumanizing them, and I just wanted to mention that. With yeah, I agree, and it's uh, you know words. The word brainwashing has also been used to the point where it it also is not is not des describing the process which it was coined initially, which was about Korean War prisoners and such. But, you know, words are tools. They should be used to help us to expand our understanding of reality and to, to communicate better with ourselves and with others. But unfortunately, words can also constrict and narrow. And I do think that it's important to remember that people are human beings and that they deserve respect and they deserve love and they deserve uh, honor. and. Not just, and I, and I blame the media. We haven't, we haven't trashed the media, but the media circus around Jonestown was horrendous. People said, well, why didn't you go down to Texas, Steve? And the truth is I would have gotten a lot of media if I had gone down to Texas after the initial siege. I probably would have sold a lot of copies of my book, but I was repulsed by the idea of jumping in a media circus, personally. No, I haven't had a chance to read his report, but I, I basically I think that with the exception of Professor Guffman's uh, investigation of the ATF and Dr. Stone's investigation, I think the rest was a big whitewash. And I still think there needs to be a really good, thorough investigation. And I think the public deserves to have that. I, I haven't read his. And you know, unfortunately, I'm very, very busy. And this, for me, is this, this thing. And, and when I was asked by, by Tom Ferrick to, uh, to come and give this talk, I immediately said yes, because I haven't said what I've said publicly for a year. And it needed to be said, and hopefully, you know, it will, will get out to the appropriate sources. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I think the why, why uh, the ATF did what they did was to try to get media and, and to, to... In a way, the government, the FBI, uh, it's a cult. It's a cult of violence. And uh, these, are, these are the people who believe you can't cut it. You have to show 
straight and forth and speaking this. There's no question, there's no question in my mind that there is control of behavior, thoughts, feelings, and information within the United States. I, I read a publication called Covert Action in, uh, Bulletin, which is a group of former CIA agents who are critical of government covert operations and such. And, you know, I do believe there's censorship in the United States media. It's, it's not total, but they're in the big thing. I was interviewed by Time Magazine right after Waco went up in flames to talk about how my book was given and uh, top officials knew about my existence and nothing was done and what they did wrong and the story was killed. I, I don't, I can't say that the government killed it. Okay, true. So I, I, I take, I retract that. But I, 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 I my senses, and, and I voted for Clinton and I'm, I, I confess. Uh, but I think that there were political considerations to not make the administration look bad. And, and, and how, how to not look bad when, when innocent men, women, and children, in my opinion, die for, for no reason. Thank you for coming.